Good evening, buenas noches, bienvenidos, bienvenidas, welcome everyone. My name is Gabriela Ramirez Vargas and I'll be your moderator tonight. Before we officially open our event, I would like to thank you all for being here with us tonight and begin by acknowledging our sponsors and guests. At this time, I would like to provide a very special warm welcome to the representatives of the Dominican Republic government, Ms. Janet Camila, Minister of Women of the Dominican Republic and Deputy Attorney General for Women Affairs, Roxana Reyes, for their continued support of these side events that provide access to our students and community to the United Nations. The CUNY Black Male Initiative, Mr. Jermaine Wright and Sean Best, the Ronald H. Brown Program at John Jay College, the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development, Carmen Pacheco, President of the Puerto Rican Bar Association and former President Betty Lugo, the Department of Latin American and Latina Latino Studies and CUNY Research Foundation for their sponsorship tonight. We were able to bring over 130 special individuals here tonight from our local community and from universities and colleges across the state. I would like to quickly recognize the following individuals and groups. The Honorable Carmen Velasquez from the Queen Supreme Court, our wonderful students of John Jay College, Hunter, Brooklyn College, SUNY Buffalo and St. John's University, among other colleges across New York City. Our John Jay College Ronald H. Brown Fellows, our peers from the Student Academic Support Program and Adelante students, CUNY Black Male Initiative students, and a special acknowledgement to our students from the Young Women's Leadership School of East Harlem and the College Bound Program. Representatives from the Mayor De Mayor Bill de Blasio's office, Kings County District Attorney's office, the Legal Aid Society, the Hispanic Association Chambers of Commerce, Latino Justice, President Juan Cartagena, and Vianney Pichardo, President of the Dominican Bar Association. Okay. I would like now to officially open the site event, Combating Mass Incarceration, Improving Systematic Justice and Policing, Impact on Women, marginalized communities in Latin America and the Caribbean. And turn the floor immediately to Dr. Jody Rory, who will provide us with the opening remarks. Can get used to this ambassador. <laughs> Good evening, buenas tardes. Hello, buenas tardes. Uh, I'm going to provide some words on uh, behalf of uh, Mrs. Uh, Janet Camilo, the Minister of Women from the Dominican Republic, who was unable to be with us here tonight. Uh, the theme um, at the Commission on Status of Women 61, which is why we're here this week tonight, is women's economic empowerment in the changing world of work. Um, and this theme directly correlates with those championed during side events previously sponsored by the Dominican Republic government, specifically by Mrs. Margarita Cedeño Fernandez, the Vice President of the Dominican Republic and the Permanent Mission of the Dominican Republic at both the Commission on Status of Women 57 and the Human Rights Council during its 23rd session. Our current side event today is one of a handful of UN events representing a range of country reports within the Latin American and Caribbean region at the Commission on Status of Women. This event and its predecessors, hosted at CSW 57 and HRC 23, have historically been unique in their coverage of this topic in the Latin American and Caribbean region <clears throat> in this manner, with the participation of such high-level scholars in the field. Um, this session in particular looks to be particularly innovative in that it will seek to discuss male participation in taking responsibility for aiding to eradicate violence against women and assisting in creating avenues towards economic empowerment for women through field work studies on the ground. These panels provide quantitative and qualitative research perspectives and studies on violence against women and girls in Latin America and the Caribbean and the diaspora, demonstrating that in the public and private spheres, violence impacts gender human rights, social justice, equality, and empowerment. The previous panels were unique and provided a necessary and welcome voice for these issues at the UN level. The events also offered an analysis of international human rights documents, a review of existing domestic violence data, and findings of extensive groundbreaking research studies in the region. 
In addition, a, discussing, a discussion of policy programs and movements that are bringing progress against domestic violence in Latin America, the Caribbean, and the diaspora were also discussed. The current review theme for CSW 61 focuses on the challenges and achievements in the implementation of the Millennium Development Goals, which are termed MDGs, for women and girls. And this CSW 61 high-level side event is therefore entitled Combating Mass Incarceration, Improving Systemic Justice, and Policing, Impact on Women and Marginalized Communities in Latin America and the Caribbean, and will focus on how Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, as the successor development targets to the MDGs, can accomplish women's economic empowerment in the changing world of work by addressing pressing social issues currently subjugating women and marginalized groups in Latin America and the Caribbean with emphasis on its diaspora and the elimination of obstacles to the economic empowerment of women. SDG 5 aims to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Commenting on steps made towards this goal, the report of the Secretary General quotes, progress towards the sustainable development goals views violence against women and girls as a violation of their human rights and a hindrance to their development. This is an issue women in the Latin American and Caribbean region and its diaspora have been subject to, and the effect is compounded when gender is intersected by factors including race, ethnicity, national origin, immigration status, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and these are just some areas to name a few. We've provided with you a handout of the bios of the uh, discussant of the panelists, but more importantly, there's a glossary, and you can understand some of the terms that the panelists will be using today if you just review those glossaries. The MDGs and the SDGs are listed there, so as we list them in our discussions, you can follow our conversations by going through those in that glossary. So I'd like to close that welcoming keynote statement, and thank you for being with us here today. Thank you, Dr. Rory. At this time, I would like to officially welcome our distinguished members of the panel. Okay. We have distributed the impressive bios of all of our panelists for our audience to review on your own time. Hence, I will not be reading the bio so that we may spend our time engaging with one another on our topic on violence against women. The panelists will present for 12 minutes each, and once they are all done presenting, we will have a 30-minute question and answer session, all from the audience. I will later conclude and ask that all participants kindly exit the building in an orderly fashion. Panelists, please remember, I will remind you as well you each have 12 minutes to present. Guests, this CSW61 panel will provide you with an overview of violence against women's situation in countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, with a focus on the Caribbean and marginalized communities herein. Two major issues in the United States that have dramatically impacted the Latin American and Caribbean diaspora are policing and mass incarceration, and they will be discussed as it pertains to women's economic empowerment in the changing world of work, which is the theme of this year's CSW61. Most violence is perpetrated by intimate partners, and 21% of girls and women aged between 15 and 49 experience physical and or sexual violence at the hands of an intimate partner in their previous 12 months. These and other statistics render women and girls unable to work, contribute to their self-sustainability, the workforce, the family unit, and the global market, thereby affecting us all. Additionally, as global society, we have become increasingly aware of the need to improve our policing and incarceration policies and raise of set rates, especially as it pertains to women and marginalized groups. These issues will be addressed on this panel with recommendations on how to improve the safety of all persons in, in such situations. Thank you, and let us begin. Now, I would like to invite our first guest speaker, Dr. Henry Leonard MacDonald, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission of the Republic of Suriname to the United Nations, and he for she Campaign Ambassador for the Advancement of Women. 
Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Moderator. Um, let me first say that t tonight I'm not going to speak about mass incarceration and uh, struggles and problems of women in the prison and uh, police lockups. Um, I was specifically asked to say a few words on uh, the He for She campaign and why I think it is important for men to, to, to join this struggle. I hope that um, after I spoke, certainly the men in this room will understand why it is important for them to become um, main um, fighters to attain gender equality, empower women, and to stop violence against women. Um, let me start by saying that the entire world community consists of 7.5 billion people. 7.5 billion people. Violence against women and girls is the biggest human rights violation on earth simply because we are talking about the violence against half of the world community. 3.7 billion women and girls. It is also important to know that men and women are living in two different security and safety worlds. And that's why I think it is important to talk to men as well. This week is the week of uh, CSW, and you can, this is the first meeting where the audience is almost 50-50. Every other meeting I went, I spoke, 90% women, 10% guys. And the guys in the room are the photographers and those who are helping with the organization. But this is totally different, and I really commend the, organize, the organizers for having such a um, diverse and good audience. Um, last week I spoke and I, I was thinking uh, to present the audience with 20 facts that only happen to women in the world. And I was thinking, okay, what only happens to boys and, 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 and men? I think to boys, I, I, I came up with two things. Those, those were the child soldiers. And when you think about the drama that happened in the Catholic Church where the boys were, you know, we all know what's happened. Those are the two only main things which I was able to think of that is happening to, with boys globally. With respect to women and girls, I got more than 20. But here tonight, I'm going to share maybe 12 or 13 with you. First fact, seven in 10 women will be confronted with violence in their life, period. And when I talk about that, I don't talk about seven of seven in 10 women somewhere at Central Park, right in this room, seven in 10, is globally. One in two women killed violently will be murdered by their husband, boyfriend, or a male family member. One in two. Of course, women kill men too, but there the number is one in 21. So if 21 men died violently, one will be killed by a woman. But women, it is one in two. Honor killings, mostly to women. Rape as a punishment, rape as a weapon of war, happens only to women. In the United States, one in five women will be raped. Just in my country, and this report was released today, or yesterday, but I read it today in the newspaper, every day one woman is being reported raped in Suriname. But in the United States, one in five women will be raped. And of course, men are being raped here too. But there the number is one in 71. And think about it. Many of the women that are being raped are being raped by men. And the men that are being raped are also being raped often by men, by other men. So that is the thing we should think about. Female genital mutilation has nothing to do with girls' health. Child brides. I don't know any community in the world where it is normal for boys of 12 and 13 years old to marry women of 30 years old and older. We all know that it happens to women all over the place. There are 33 million fewer girls than boys in primary school globally. 75% of AIDS cases in Sub-Sahara Africa, the region hardest hit by the disease, are women and girls. In a single year, an estimate of 150 million girls are victims of sexual violence. 50% of all sexual assaults in the world are on girls under the age of 15 years old. 14 million girls under the age of 18 
will be married this year, 38,000 just today, 15 girls the last 30 seconds, so every two seconds, one girl under the age of 18 is being married. And the last fact I have here for you is every four seconds, a girl under the age of 18 becomes pregnant, many raised by husbands even when they are physically not ready. And let me tell you that there is a study of UN women that declares that it will take us 84 years for women and feminist groups to reach the stage of gender equality. And uh, I believe that, that we will reach that stage someday. But only if women, if the women's group and the feminist group work on it, then we will reach it in 84 years. And let me tell you, let me give you three examples of terrible things that happened in history and they were stopped. Slavery, 400 years, it was stopped. Apartheid, also terrible, took many years, decades, was stopped as well. And what is the third one? Um, colonialism. We don't have so many col col colonies in the world anymore. So I believe that, but I believe if men join this struggle, if men understand that it is in their own personal interest as well, that we can, we can, we can reach this stage in 15 to 20 years. That's why I'm working so hard and uh, UN Women is working so hard to, you know, to involve men to, 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 to give them the knowledge about this. Mm. Let me also say that too often men see these issues, women's struggles, violence against women, empowerment of, as women's issues. So we are really comfortable if 100 or 200 women meet in a room and they're talking to themselves. Uh, we don't have a problem with that. And that is something which we should think about as well. But as a man, I, I'm, I'm, I know, I'm, I'm a guy too, so I know that we guys, the person we are most, the persons we are most concerned about when we think about their security is mom. Many of us are mama's boys, we know that. We don't say it, but we are that. If you have a daughter, when we have daughters, we are very concerned about their security and safety. Sisters, your wife, your girlfriend, but often we forget, guys forget, that when you're not physically with your loved ones, with your mom or your daughter or your sister, you're somewhere else and she's by herself. For many other men, she just become one of the 3.7 billion women over there, one of the chicks out there, just to put it uh, bluntly. And I strongly believe that we're gonna be able to change the the, 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 the spectrum, the, the, the entire um, uh, thinking of men when they see that it is in their own personal interest. Because if you're not with your mom, your mom is just one of the other women there. So every guy will look at her as one of them. And if we want to change that, then we should at least be, um, be, 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 be ready to approach other men and to discuss, to have this discussion with them. For them, that's why at the UN we started the He For She campaign. There's guys who carry this pin, are guys who are not afraid to speak in favor of women's rights and uh, gender equality because they know that at the end of the day, they will be, will be the beneficiaries of this all. Um, let, me, let me finish with two, two, two examples. Uh, two examples I always, always use to, when I talk to guys, for them to understand that women and men are living in two different worlds. And this example, I think every woman won't knows it, but I, I'm sure that many of the guys, um, after I, 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 I uh, give them, they will understand uh, what I'm talking about. Let's say tonight at two o'clock in the morning, I will ask one of the ladies in this room to walk from here to Times Square by herself. Every woman would ask me if I'm crazy because they're not gonna do that because it's not safe. But there is no other way and she needs to do it. While she's walking to Times Square, out of the sudden, four guys are coming in, are coming from the opposite way. And it doesn't matter if are four white guys, black guys, Asians, Chinese guys, old guys, young guys, four guys are coming. Many women, 
will immediately think of crossing the street and whatever on the other side. The women I know, many of them, they will cross the street and walk on the other side because of their safety. Same scenario. One of the guys here needs to walk to Times Square at 2 o'clock in the morning. The, 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 what I will hear from them is that it is cold, this is too far, and those stories. But let's say he's walking, and out of the blue, four women are coming from the other side of the street. I don't know many guys who will even think of crossing the street. In fact, the guys I know, including myself, I will stay on this side of the street. <laughs> that is one. The second example is when you go, let's say we all go to, went to the club tonight and uh, we are having a good time. The guys are together, the ladies are together. When one guy will go to the toilet, what we see, he will say, hey guys, I'm going to the restroom and you'll, I will be back in, in a few minutes. Same scenario with women. One will ask another to come with her, or the entire group will go together to the bathroom. <laughs> and these are just two examples for guys to understand that when we think about security and safety of ourselves, women has, are living in a totally, a completely different world. Let me, I have one more minute. Let me, in closing, let me say this. If there is one global issue that has nothing to do with race or ethnicity, nothing to do with income, financial, social status, or age, nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with nationality, or if the person is disabled or not, that critical issue is violence against women and girls. And I believe that men have the moral responsibility to help, uh, responsibility to help correct this situation since our moms, daughters, sisters, aunts, other female family members and friends are still, are still suffering a great deal. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador McDonald. Tonight, the director of the Tahiti Justice Center, Leila Miller Muro, was unable to be here with us. I would like to ask Professor Jody Rower to introduce our next and very courageous panelists. We just want to let you know that on Tuesday everybody was able to be here, but the snow didn't let us be here. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit more than uh, I was planning to. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased, um, and, and thank you so much, Ambassador, for, for those uh, great words and great examples. And, um, and they're so true, and, and they resonate so much with us. Um, on behalf of, of Laylee, I'd like to um, just um, say that I'm very pleased to introduce Marsha, our next panelist. Um, she's a courageous survivor of domestic violence from Jamaica, uh, who was married to a police officer in the United States. And after deciding to leave him, uh, she was assisted by the Tahare Justice Center, which is a national nonprofit organization that provides free holistic legal services for immigrant women and girls fleeing human rights abuses. With offices in the Washington, D.C. area, San Francisco, Houston, and Baltimore, they protect over 2,000 women and children per year from violence and also engage in public policy advocacy to ensure that laws and policies systemically protect women and girls fleeing human rights abuses. We are also so grateful that Marsha has come all the way from Washington, D.C. area to be with us today. Uh, she now works as a case manager, helping others struggling to rebuild their lives, find emergency housing, and other social services. So if you would be so kind as to help us give a warm welcome to Marsha. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Gabby. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I was afraid to take on this challenge when I was initially asked. However, four days later, after being told the horrible news that my uncle, one of the biggest heroes in my life, died suddenly at the age of 41, the week before last, I decided to honor his memory by trying to save others who have the unfortunate experience of domestic abuse or domestic violence. My uncle physically showed up September 22, 2012 at my apartment, risking his own life to
to ensure that I got away from my ex-husband once he became aware of what was happening. There are many women who would love to get out of their abusive relationships and do not have the ability to do so, and there are those who die at the hands of their abuser. I would like to honor his memory by sharing my story and attempting to save someone's life. One in every four women and one in every seven men experience domestic violence. It affects people of all socioeconomic, cultural, and religious backgrounds. It is a painful process, and like so many others, I suffered silently. There were days I felt like my screams for help went unrecognized. It appeared that people were busy living their lives and either did not have the resources to be able to help or they didn't want to be bothered. It didn't help that I wore the biggest smile on my face daily going to work, the grocery store, even to the doctor's office. I can say that I'm stronger today because strength was my only option. I have lived my life with my favorite quote in mind. Courage is not defined by those who fought and did not fall, but by those who fought, fell, and rose again. I met him in 2007 at a restaurant. While standing in the restaurant, swinging my body to the sound of reggae music, a man dressed in uniform struck up a conversation with a simple question, what's good on the menu to eat? This man, I later learned, would change the rest of my life. In the less than three minutes of conversation, he discovered that I was new to America and the district and was learning my way around the DMV. He offered to be my tour guide in the event I was lost getting to and from Washington, D.C. He stepped out of the restaurant and went to the exit door where he had already taken a picture of me with my back turned and was anticipating getting to know me better by exchanging numbers. We did. I wasn't looking for a relationship at the time, but over the next few months, he was helpful, protective, funny, and caring. With very little exposure and knowledge of the signs of domestic abuse at the age of 24, I welcomed the multiple calls during my day at home, at work, and during my daily commute, checking to see what I was doing and where I was. In retrospection, I can now say my relationship was primarily built on fear. My ex-husband, a now retired federal police officer, who is nine years older, appeared powerful. He created the impression that there was nothing that I could hide from him that he couldn't access through his job. I found myself not wanting him to know where I lived in Virginia, as this was my aunt and uncle's house. But due to an unfortunate incident where my car was broken into, I had to ask for his help getting home. He additionally assisted in getting my car fixed, reobtaining my driver's license and travel documents that were stolen from the car. He was attentive. He would spontaneously do things that made me realize he was listening. I found myself trusting him and letting my guard down. And after four months of us getting to know each other, he drove to my job one night and suggested that we move in together in Maryland. I was hesitant. This was my first time living with someone I was dating, and Maryland was unfamiliar to me. He was visibly upset and told me that he was tired of people playing games with his feelings and emotions, and that if I decide to not move in with him, he would know that I was playing games with his emotions as well. I was afraid of what his reaction would be, and I didn't want to bring harm to myself and my family. In the next four years, we moved six times to three states. The farthest was Pennsylvania. Shortly after moving in together, my ex-husband accompanied me to the hospital to do surgery on the base of my spine. During my recovery at home, he would call constantly, spending almost his entire shift on the phone. He would come home and ask if I spoke to anyone else during my day, and I would answer honestly, sharing the names of close friends and family members who were checking in on my progress. He demanded that I give my phone to him to confirm this, or he could access this information on his job, since he was a federal police officer and could get this information with a phone call. I believed him. As time went on, he would search my phone while I was sleeping. I felt like a criminal being investigated and simply complied with his request. From the stress, I ended up in the emergency room after profusely bleeding from the surgical site that would take months to heal. He left his job in the middle of a shift one night while I was recovering and came home very angry after he learned that I was online talking to friends, one of whom was an ex-boyfriend. He was so angry he kicked the refrigerator, yelled at the top of his lungs, grabbed his bags and started packing them. I was shaking. I was afraid and at this point felt trapped 
since I did not know my way from Maryland to Virginia and had signed a lease that he told me I could be criminally charged on if I broke the terms of the lease. Despite having difficulty walking, I left the house that night to avoid him hitting me and drove around outside in pain. He called while I was out and begged me to come home. He told me he would never hit me, he would calm down and we would talk. I had called my friends crying and their advice was to get out while I could after overhearing the conversation. He apologized for his actions and I did also. As the months went on, he became even more controlling. He made decisions for everything. He wouldn't let me use birth control. He controlled my money and wouldn't let me pay bills unless he agreed. He controlled where I worked, how long I worked there, and who my coworkers were. He controlled my access to my family and friends, monitoring my cell phone and computer. We had discussed marriages many times, but I told him that I didn't want to be married, but we had a child together. He reminded me daily that my child was a US citizen and that would require his permission to obtain a passport. One day he called and said he wanted us to get married today. I should get dressed, get our daughter dressed, and let's go to the courthouse to get the license. He had phoned an efficient, a retired police officer. I wore a red shirt, black jeans, and flats. I took no pictures of the day, but my memory won't let it go. It's the day that my sentence was handed down, and it would take every ounce of strength to serve my time and get out alive. My ex-husband controlled my immigration status. He delayed filing for my permanent resident card after we got married. He delayed filing his tax returns as well, something he knew I would need to provide to USCIS. He would often say he was saving the money, and even after one of my girlfriends gave me the filing fee, he withdrew it from my account and bought a Wii game for $600 for his son from his previous marriage. He would often say that I'm worried for no reason because he was a federal police officer so I would not go out of status. He would often say, if I file your immigration papers, you are going to leave me. One night in the middle of September 2010, while spending the weekend with my aunt during one of our major fights, my friend called and asked if I was okay. I told her yes and asked why. She told me my ex just posted on Facebook, goodbye everybody. A short while later, I saw him peeking into the window at my aunt's house. I got so afraid that he would kill me, my aunt and uncle, like he had threatened to break into his ex-wife's house, kill her and her family and take her kids. I decided that it would be better to go back to him. I was also afraid that my ex-husband would either kill himself or kill me. I spent many nights sitting in my car waiting on my ex-husband to calm down after he would get angry kicking things and yelling. And on July 30, 2011, when I returned to the room at 3.30 a.m., he left to go for a walk. A little while later, he sent a text message telling me to call the police and tell them that his body was behind Hooters restaurant. When I did not respond, he came home angry. He was still very angry the next day. He had asked me to take him somewhere and during my commute, we stopped at the gas station nearby. He took my credit card and left the car. When I asked him for my credit card to purchase milk for our son, he refused. He told me that, quote, I need you to know I am the man in the relationship. Next time I'm leaving, I'm not leaving anything behind me. I'm not going through another custody battle, end of quote. I understood his words to be a threat on my life. I knew he had a gun, the same gun he would load when he would threaten to kill himself. I called the police, and while I was calling, he laughed and told me they would deport me since I wasn't a citizen. And he also told me they would not consider it a threat. When the police arrived, he was right. It was like calling frat boys to a party. I finally came to terms with the fact that I was in an abusive relationship. It's sometimes difficult for me to accept that I did not recognize the signs and leave sooner. Once I had accepted this notion, I made the decision to case manage myself and take the same advice I would have offered my clients. I worked with youth then who were being sexually exploited. I did the safety planning. I got linked to domestic violence resources in my county and began attending counseling sessions. I removed all my legal and travel documents as well as my children's legal documents from my home and gave them to my aunt. 
My ex-husband by this time had developed tolerance to his painkillers, mostly narcotics, and was displaying signs of substance abuse, with his daily intake increasing up to 38 prescribed pills per day. He would even break up the drug sits so they would hit his bloodstream faster. In 2012, after becoming angry that he couldn't find his remote control, he grabbed my arm, twisted it, threw me to the ground, then onto the bed as if he was arresting me. He put his elbow in, in my neck and told me, don't effing touch him. I told him he was hurting me and that my previously injured shoulder was in pain. He only decided to let go when, my two, when our two-year-old daughter started crying loudly and ran to me asking, are you okay, mommy? I did not call the police. Two weeks later, after another major fight which resulted in me calling my aunt, my uncle, who was asleep, was awakened by the sound of my ex-husband's voice yelling at the top of his lungs and me crying on the phone. He told me to text him my address and get the babies dressed grab our dirty laundry, and he would see me in an hour. From the moment I left September 22, 2012, he started texting and calling. I would respond occasionally to try to appease him. He told me he would find me. He knew where my aunt worked, and he would follow her home one day. He also told me he would call immigration and have me deported because both of us couldn't live in the United States. He often told me he would ship me back to Jamaica, and it was the mediator in our custody case who, listening to him say it repeatedly in an aggressive manner, warned me with these words. Be careful. Do not meet him anywhere that is not in public with a lot of people around. His threat to ship you home tells me his intentions aren't good. And by Thanksgiving Day, I had received over 6,000 text messages, and he had spent three days arguing via text with my uncle. He called Pennsylvania police to tell them I kidnapped his children and he didn't know where to find me. He had also filed our children missing and exploited in the state of Virginia. I was scared. Anx anxiety and fear gripped my life and took hold of me. Every Pennsylvania tag on the highway made my heart race. I was afraid to leave my apartment to go to work or to take the kids to the babysitter. I was afraid to sleep, to think. Among the resources my, D, my DV counselor provided was a number to a wonderful organization, Tahiri Justice Center. She shared that they served women who were faced with similar issues adjust their immigration status. I called Tahiri Justice Center and the receptionist's voice was the most calming and understanding voice I had heard in years. When she asked me my availab availability to meet for intake, I was overcome with emotions. Every person I worked with at Tahiri Justice Center did safety planning with me and wanted to ensure my safety at all times. Lindsay, an attorney at Tahiri, offered to take my case and assisted with linking me to a pro bono attorney in DC, Amy. They were patient, helpful, understanding, and caring. They weren't just concerned about immigration. They wanted to ensure that my children were okay. When I decided to file custody and visitation, despite the threats, they offered to assist. Anna Shea offered support for more than a year until my divorce was final. They became another hero in my life, one that I'm truly grateful for. My ex-husband in his first attempt to see the children after I'd obtained custody and supervised visits with Anna Shea's help, asked prior to the visit if he could come by my apartment to rest. I told him no. He told me he was tired and he needed time to rest before seeing the children. Yet again, I said no. He asked if he could put the kids in his car and drive them around. I also said no. He told me, if I don't see these kids today, you'll have a bullet in your head by tomorrow. He repeated this. I was afraid, shaking and, and crying. I hung up and called the police. Officer Burke, another hero in my story, was the officer my ex called when he realized I would not show up the same officer who, was also, who also followed up on my call. He shared that he thought it was a red flag when my ex-husband told him to tell me that it was safe where he was at the mall. He advised me on obtaining an emergency protective order. Domestic abuse impacts your emotional, physical, psychological, social, and spiritual health. The scars, shame, and guilt that we carry with us as survivors 
make it a lot harder to move on. I have been told so many times that I didn't deserve the abuse. Four and a half years later, I'm finally at a place where I can hear it. As a parent, I work twice as hard to empower and educate my two children in an effort to break the cycle of domestic violence. My ex-husband's treatment of me still affects me. I still struggle with anxiety. It felt like I lost years of my life despite being free of him. I felt trapped. Domestic abuse is never okay. It is not something you just ignore or that will just stop. But as a community, we can come together and support those in need. Others did help me when I was finally open to help. The police did finally help me, and I am safe now. Thank you for listening to my story, and thank you for caring. Thank you so much, Marsha, for sharing your story with us. Okay. So our next panelist, Deputy Attorney General for Women's Affairs to the Dominican Republic, Ms. Roxana Reyes, was unable to be here with us again due to the snowstorm of last week and some previous engagements. Ms. Reyes graciously sent us a video recording with her testimonial. Please take your attention to the video on the screen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Roxana Reyes, Deputy Attorney General of the Dominican Republic in charge of domestic violence, gender-based violence, child abuse, and many other issues related to this uh, thing. I apologize because I am not here with you today, but in video, thankful to the technologies, I, I am with you. Uh, at this time, we are going to talk or we are going to share with you the response of the public ministry to violence against women in Dominican Republic according to Sustainable Development Goal 5, which means that achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. As you can see in our PowerPoint presentation, um, yeah, and according to the Sustainable Development Goal 5, a deep understanding of the laws of the Dominican Republic which protect women against violence, domestic violence, femicide, uh, domestic violence data, statistics, and the structures, centers, services in place that assist women, including recommendations and solutions. Uh, as you can see here uh, about our legislation, we have in our Constitution Article 42 that condemns domestic and gender-based violence in any form. Also, many international treatments related to gender equality and empower all women and girls in Dominican Republic. Inter-American Convention on the Prevention, Punishment, and eradication uh, of violence against women. This is the Convention of Belém do Pará in Brazil. Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. We have another uh, law, 24 of 1997, related to gender-based violence. It establishes for the first time in our uh, legislation sanctions for some forms of violence against women. Uh, if we are going to talk about stages of gender-based violence in our country, we can tell you that 187 women lost their lives violently, violently uh, every year. 53% uh, of women murdered are femicides. Approximately 80% of femicides never reported their situation of violence. Also, only in 2016, we registered 64,704 complaints of domestic and gender-based violence. Uh, we are talking about 647 per 1,000 inhabitants. In 
2016, we filled 6,041 complaints of sexual offenses. We are talking about 641 per 1,000 inhabitants. About the response of the Public Prosecutor's Office for the care, followed up, and criminal prosecution of cases of violence, uh, my dispatch, which is the Deputy Attorney General for Women Affairs, uh, is responsible for articulating the criminal policy throughout the national territory for the approach, integral attention to gender-based violence, domestic violence, and sexual assaults, as well as the criminal prosecution. And um, now we have 35 prosecution offices all over the country. Uh, in some cases, uh, these offices has the community prosecutor offices, such as the National District and the province of Santo Domingo, which is the most, uh, the, is the biggest one of the country. About two, 12 prosecutors per 1,000 inhabitants. Uh, also, we have 19 facilities uh, to attend victims of domestic violence all over the country. Uh, the services that we have here are file of gender-based violence allegations, protection to victims, forensic medical evaluations, forensic psychology evaluation, police response to domestic violence. Also, as you can see in this map, there are the places where are located our specialized units to work with or to deal with gender-based by uh, violence and domestic violence and sexual offenses. Uh, also, we have uh, in the system, as part of our system, to respond uh, to these uh, situations, the National Directory of Victim Care, uh, which is in Spanish, uh, Dirección Nacional de Atención a Víctimas. Uh, this office supervises the services related to the protection and care of the victims. Also, the Directorate of Legal Representation of Victims and Witnesses. Uh, this office freely provides legal aid service to victims of domestic violence. Um, also, the Center for Domestic Violence Supervisor, Survivors, I mean, uh, specialized uh, professionals uh, provide psychotherapeutic assistance to victims of these crimes. Uh, we have also the Center for Behavioral Intervention for Men, because men are a very important part of this situation. Uh, it, this center works with the learning of new masculinity through the use of techniques uh, for these purposes by qualified professionals. Now there are two centers, working one in the National District and the other one in the south part of our island, uh, the, the district of San Juan de la Maguana. Uh, this year, we, have, we, we are going to open two new centers to work or to deal with these matters. Uh, the Lifeline is a special uh, hotline coordinated uh, with 911 or 911 system of emergency. Uh, it provides emergency assistance to victims of gender-based violence. And as you can see, those are many things that we are working on or dealing with because as a deputy attorney general, as a citizen, I believe that the gender-based violence and the violence against women are, is preventable. So we work with that. We are facing this problem uh, with the inversion, with investments, with all of the resources, uh, human resources and the money and the budgets 
to make uh, life of our women and children and adolescents better. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next presenter, Professor Maria Dolores Fernos, was unable to be here today with us due to a previous engagement. So tonight we have Ms. Cristina Licea, student of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, here to read Professor Fernot's statement this evening. Good evening. My name is Christina Alicea, and I am a student at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I met Professor Maria Dolores Fernos last week while she was here to attend this event, which was originally scheduled for last Tuesday before the snow closed the UN. She was unable to make it here today due to important human rights work she is conducting in Puerto Rico. I am honored to have been selected to read her statement as I too aspire to be a human rights advocate and an attorney. On her behalf, I extend a fraternal welcome to all and thank the Dominican Republic government and fellow panelists for the opportunity to share the status of gender violence in Puerto Rico, which is also inclusive of not only Puerto Rican women, but immigrant women from Latin America and the, and the Caribbean region and other parts of the world who immigrate to Puerto Rico. Strategies Against Gender Violence in Puerto Rico have they succeeded? By Maria Dolores Felnos. As a result of hundreds of years of gender discrimination and exclusion, violence against women has been a staple of our societies worldwide. Some countries have advanced at great speed in the quest for gender equality, and others have hardly moved in that direction. But what has happened in the Caribbean region? Countries in our Caribbean region have worked hard to develop instruments to achieve this goal and important advances have been made, which cannot and should not be minimized. Still, there is a long way to go. Specifically regarding advances and challenges in Puerto Rico, the women's movement is first of all conscious that thousands of years of discrimination are not erased automatically, nor can equality be achieved with a stroke of a pen. This understanding has helped us to gauge the circumstances at every period and design the strategies accordingly. It has also helped us not to despair and give up. I will share with you today what we have done, the successes we have achieved, and also the challenges that we face. In Puerto Rico, the women's movements have followed almost to a T the best practices recommended by the specialized UN organisms to combat gender violence. As an example, I can proudly state that Puerto Rico was the first jurisdiction in our region to adopt legislation making domestic violence as seri a serious crime. This was in 1889, sorry, 1989. Our statute, Law 54, has been used as model legislation for several countries in the region. It was not our only significant success, as the previous year we won the adoption of a law sanctioning sexual harassment in the workplace. Since the adoption of the law against domestic violence, it was strongly resisted by those precisely entrusted with guaranteeing its compliance. Police, prosecutors, and even judges waved off its importance and refused to properly tend to complaints, to file charges, or to process cases. In response, NGOs and women's organizations made violence against women the main priority in their agendas and kept the pressure, demanding the adoptions of protocols to force public officers to respond to victims' needs and to facilitate supervision. Women's service providers and feminist organizations developed strategies to inform and educate the community on the provisions of the law and urged women to take action to protect themselves. Our strategies, in addition to law reform, were also implemented at the same time. Shelters for victims and their children were established throughout the island. Members of the police force, prosecutors, and judicial branch employees were trained and specialized domestic violence units were created. In each judicial region, specially trained policemen and women, as well as prosecutors, were appointed to tend exclusively to gender violence cases. In several judicial regions, specialized courts were also established. But these were never enough, as even with these efforts, resistance to the law from the official governmental structure continued. Obviously, scattered training is not enough, and supervision is direly needed. But what entity is independent enough to do this job without strings attached? To counter the serious problem, women's organizations lobbied for the strengthening of the state mechanism for women's rights, 
that had been created in the 1970s. This mechanism, the State Commission for Women Affairs, had been instrumental in the adoption of the law against sexual harassment in the workforce and one penalizing domestic violence. However, it had no supervisory faculties and no one to sanction noncompliance with the statutes and public policies we had fought so hard for. As a result of their demand for a governmental entity with supervisory powers to monitor the compliance with the laws, the Women's Advocate Office of Puerto Rico was created in 2001 to substitute the commission. It is, it is a significant fact that this office was created of an, under the governorship of a woman, our first woman governor. The law delegated to the advocate the power to investigate and adjudicate complaints and impose fines. More so, the woman's advocate has the power to initiate investigations on her own. The creation of the Women's Advocate Office was a remarkable breakthrough, and I was honored to be appointed the first woman's advocate, a position I held for seven years until 2007. Nonetheless, events have transpired that have not allowed for the results that we had expected or hoped for. Even though we took pains to include the law in the law that the governor had to receive recommendations from women's rights groups when appointing the advocate and for her to be someone with a history of commitment to women's rights, political considerations have dominated the selection of the advocate after I left office. Party interests and loyalties have trumped the interests of women and this has greatly affected its actions and as a consequence, its credibility. In a very evident way, it has been transformed into an arm of the executive. Party interests have detoured its feminist agenda. At this moment, the office of the woman's advocate has lost the trust of the women's organization and the NGOs, which have been at the forefront of all the crucial struggles for gender equality in Puerto Rico. This is not a consensus to prefer its repeal as that will leave a huge hole in the governmental structure for the defense of gender issues in the public debate. But the question remains, what is, the needed, what is needed to monitor and to supervise with independence? Official statistics show a slow decrease in the number of women's deaths by their intimate partners or former partners. So have the incidents of domestic violence reported to police. The public policies and legal reforms achieved in the last three decades have definitely been crucial in the constant reduction of gender-related crimes. From 40 women murdered by their partners or former partners when Law 54 was adopted, it had lowered to 17 in 2007 when I left office, and to 10 in 2016. This is a huge advance that cannot be minimized, and it clearly evidences that the strategies have been developed during the last decades have been the right ones and should be continued and strengthened. There is much more conscience in the general population of gender issues and of the existence of persistent discrimination and violence against women. We see that in the press coverages and also in the support that has been forthcoming from various professional organizations and academic research. But discrimination and violence against women is a multi-layered monster. And once in a while, it raises its horrible head. Just this last week, it was all over the news that the mayor of one of the most important cities settled a sexual harassment suit brought forth by two employees for $450,000. The facts were so scandalous that even the governor from his same party asked him to resign. To this day, he remains adamant and refuses to step down even as more than 10,000 signatures have been raised in a week demanding his resignation. His son, also an employee at City Hall, has also several claims of sexual harassment, as has the chief of the municipal police. Obviously, much more has to be done. Convictions are few under the law. The reasons are varied. On the one side, women who file charges are subjected to pressure from all sides to abandon her claims. Although Law 54 established five crimes as felonies, most cases are plea bargained for lesser charges that will never show in criminal records as a domestic violence crime. This has a huge effect if aggressors act attack again. As a record will not show recidivism, the aggressor will be eligible for probation, which means not a single day in prison. An academic study found that 70% of convicts for domestic violence never spend a day in jail. 
our strategies are needed and most probably specific amendments to the law. Educational materials with a gendered perspective as recommended by specialized organisms and academic research is a must. A school curriculum that teaches equality and respect for all humans and our rich diversity from the early formative years is one of the most effective tools in the quest for gender equality. This struggle, lasting over 40 years now, we have been unable to win. On two occasions, we have succeeded in having such a curriculum mandated by the governor, and both times it has been repealed by the succeeding governor. The main opposition has, gum, has come from the religious right, which has made this issue a pressure point with politicians who, unfortunately, have publicly negotiated before the elections. The curriculum with a gendered perspective has become one of the most important campaign issues. A recent academic investigation in which I participated with other law professors in order to identify manifestations of violence between adolescent partner relationships found that violent familial interrelations between parents are the most powerful predictors of violence in their children's future partner relationships. Violence towards women in partner relationships continues to be presented and viewed as normal. Persistent machismo stereotypes came in a strong second influence on young people's conduct. Education is thus a much needed strategy to counter these models. We are aware that social understandings that have lasted for hundreds of years are not to be dramatically transformed by a change in a law or in short two or three decades. The process of ideological transformation takes time, must be coherent, and involves several strategies and the participation of several other important societal actors. Academia, the media, organized labor, and men as a group must become part of the quest in order for change to occur. But we will stay our course. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I would like to welcome our next panelist, Dr. Jody Rohre. Thank you, Gabby. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. And I'd like to um, thank um, Ms. Janet Camilo, the Minister of Women of the Dominican Republic, for this unique opportunity um, that she's provided uh, to us tonight. And of course, the Deputy Attorney General for, General for Women Affairs, Roxana Reyes, who's always been so supportive of CUNY and John Jay students and just uh, students in general, uh, and these ideas that we come to her with every, every single year. Um, the Minister of the Permanent Mission of the Dominican Republic to the United Nations, and a special thanks to Luz Andujar, um, who really made it a special effort to get the ambassador here with us here tonight, um, and she's just so special, and now you're so special to us, right? So we've got a new friend, and we, we don't let go of our friends. I don't know if you know that. Uh, so now you're our new, our new best friend and our favorite ambassador. Don't, don't tell the other ones I said that. Okay. Um, so, and, and we really support your He for She campaign, and we take that very seriously. I think you can tell by the commitment of the men in this room, and that's our, our really strong commitment to the men in our community. Um, to make them aware of their responsibility and that they promote that responsibility in our community. Um, I want to also give a thanks to uh, Mark Jordan and uh, Jamile Eusebio of the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Um, more importantly, and this is, I'm sorry, I have to do these little shout outs, but more importantly, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our students. So just so we get a perspective here before I start talking, can our students stand up? All the students in the room stand up so we could show everybody here how many students we have. Go ahead. So can we give them a round of applause? So, and then uh, I'd just like to thank our sponsors. And I know that they're here. And we have a, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about our sponsors in a minute. Um, so my first year students in particular, Professor Gabriela Ramirez Vargas and I are teaching uh, a special CUNY BMI course and a special first year seminar course. They've been studying the UN Sustainable Goals Ambassador, just so that you know this, um, all semester. And now it's time for them to see how these sustainable development goals or these ideas that we've been talking about all semester play out at the United Nations. 
Um, so this is a really big special treat for them. And I hope that you students are enjoying your experience and you know, you're our future human rights warriors and our advocates for justice, and we really believe in you, and I think that you all understand that now, right? I mean, us bringing you here and, and making sure that we have access to this special place and that the ambassador is here with us and that we have these amazing people supporting you and supporting your careers. I hope you understand how vested we are in you. Um, and the best recommendation that I'm going to propose today, because we promised that we, the government that we would propose recommendations, is that I believe that nation states need to invest in pipeline education to create educational opportunities for our youth so that they can promote social justice reform and similar to those promoted by our CUNY BMI program. Um, and we have with us today soon-to-be lawyers in the room and Ronald Brown, Ron Brown fellows, as well as our very own Sean Best representing our program. And Sean, could you stand up for a minute? Um, and he's one of our sponsors. So uh, let me start my, my talk. So that doesn't count on my time, Gabby. Uh, uh, so almost... Uh, and, and before before I start my talk, I want to just give a special shout out to, to Gabby because I think single-handedly I have overworked probably and broke every labor law there is globally. Uh, and I won't say that, that's off the record. Um, at, the, at the UN. At, at the UN. And, and that, that's a joke. That's a joke. But Gabriella has really helped us put this together. So if we could give her a round of applause. I didn't break labor law, she volunteered her time. <laughs> so um, almost two years ago, I was asked by uh, William Ramirez, uh, who's the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Puerto Rico, um, and he happens to be Puerto Rican, to serve as a consultant on a prison project in Puerto Rico. Now, I've been working for decades as a human rights advocate and for, for women, uh, I've been doing gender justice my whole life. I think my, my father is a feminist and, and taught me gender justice issues at, since I was born. And, um, and he, he's a good he for she campaign guy. You should Very talk good. to him a little bit. Um, and when he asked me this, I, I said to myself, wow, you know, I, I've worked with this population before, but I, I never really contextualized this, but I believe that human rights apply to all human beings and all human beings are equal. Um, and William Ramirez, he's dedicated his life to bringing light to dark shadows that, we've, that have overcasted our islands in Puerto Rico when no one else would um, uncover severe human rights violations. So I didn't even blink when he asked me this. Um, so this project that I'm going to talk to you about comes on the heels of a case, a, a huge class action case, federal class action case in the United States um, called Feliciano Morales. Um, and this suit, which was closed by the U.S. First Circuit uh, approximately five years ago, despite having won the suit, um, there's human rights violations that continu continue to persist in the Puerto Rican prison system um, today. And, and, and they're pretty serious human rights violations um, that, that pers persist. So this ACLU Puerto Rico prison project has and is documenting an array of abuses, which I'll discuss momentarily. And I spent almost two years documenting these claims with my consultant partners, Jose Roque, who is unable to be here today. And I was really hoping, because he could answer a lot of the questions about the case. Uh, he's a prominent criminal lawyer, um, uh, and he was the attorney on the Feliciano, one of the attorneys on the Feliciano Morales case. And along with another colleague, um, the ACLU Puerto Rico uh, staff attorney, Josue Gonzalez, along with students from Inter-American Law School, Western Law School, Harvard Law School, um, and we've basically visit, visited prisons throughout the islands of Puerto Rico, as well as entered every vulnerable and marginalized community that we could possibly cover in this particular period to meet with formerly incarcerated persons and their families and friends to document eight areas of the most common violations that we have found um, to, to come to light. And every member on the team has had a specialty and a duty. And what I bring to this study is a human rights and a gender perspective to the report. 
Um, and I hope to share with you today a contextualization of the UN Sustainable Development Goals within this perspective. In other words, let me speak in layman's terms, right? Um, Non-UN terms so that everybody else can understand. I want to um, allow you to understand the glossary of terms that you um, have. If you could look in your paper, you'll see a glossary of terms. And they're called Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and what I want to show you is that these sustainable development goals can be used to support the observation of human rights, possible human rights violations that exist. And this is a very crucial report that's coming out of Puerto Rico right now. And William Ramirez has already published very crucial reports. He's done, he's responsible in, in large part for the police reform in Puerto Rico. And he's also responsible for a report on Guerrero prisons that's made whole global headlines. But what's unique about this report and why it's important to CSW61, and I, I heard the ambassador say, hey, I'm not here to talk to you about police reform or about mass incarceration. I was listening. <laughs> um, but what's important is that it brings a gender perspective on, uh, which is often not discussed despite the overwhelming research that Latina incarceration rates in the United States um, has increased 7% in 2014, and detention rates of Latinas are at an all-time high, and that the number of women in prisons globally is increasing, and that black and brown girls are criminalized at increasingly higher and unnoticed rates than any other group of children in the United States. And this is a population that nobody wants to talk about incarcerated persons, especially incarcerated women. But one that we must talk about, that we should talk about, and that we need to talk about, because with the rates of increasing policing oversight and the policies that are coming out of Washington in the United States that are not favorable to Latinos or people of color in general, especially undocumented persons and immigrants, we should fear seeing our numbers continue to rise in this area, given the direct correlation between bad policing and mass incarceration in communities of color. At the end, uh, we would like to make some recommendations and talk, talk about solutions. So let me turn to some slides that I have. If we could go to um, slide, and I'm not going to go through these slides a lot. I really want to go to slide 16. But before I go there, let me fast through these slides, because this is such a Professor Rory style. We have a really big problem. If we could go back for a minute. Um, the truth lies in the numbers. Mass incarceration is becoming a global endemic, and it disparately compounds the violence suffered by marginalized groups. So we'll go to the next slide. I want to just point out that 10 million people around the world are being held in prisons. More than 700,000 are women. There are 1.2 million women under the supervision of the U.S. correctional system. That's a lot of women. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. Did you know that? No. Do you think you should know that? Yes. yes. Three, point, uh, three million people are being held on remand, awaiting trial in many cases in connection with minor theft-related charges. These are not violent crimes. Is that clear? OK. Um, in the US, 65 million people have an arrest record and experience, quote, the civilian death of discrimination by employers and landlords and whoever else conducts a background check. And this is Justice Soto, Sonia, uh, Sonia Sotomayor in the case of Utah versus Strife in the October term of the US Supreme Court 2015. Does this make sense to you all now? OK. So these are going to, I'm not going to have time to go through these, but I did talk about these basically. And what I want you to understand is that the number of prisoners now exceeds official prison capacities in 116 countries around the world. Go next slide. Um, this is happening in the United States, and it's happening in Argentina. And the female prison rate is increasing faster than the male, pres male prisoner rate. Next slide. Women in prison are char charged with minor nonviolent offenses. They're in prison and basically due to, um, and most of them are in prison due to their poverty and their inability to pay fines. The bail bond industry is a big lobby industry, and they target these impoverished communities. And bad policing practices, which we'll talk about in the next panel, affect our communities, most of the people in these rooms. 
the communities that people in this room represent. Next slide. I'm um, sorry, previous slide for a second. One of the recommendations is we can start looking at community sanctions and measures that would serve the social reintegration requirements of a vast majority much more effectively than imprisonment, which costs us taxpayers a lot of money. Uh, despite the unanimous research and underlying the particular detrimental effects of prison on women, their special needs are rarely taken into consideration during imprisonment. This is all according to the United Nations reports. Next slide. And we're finding this in all of our research that we're doing right now in Puerto Rico. Accessing justice on an equal basis is difficult for women. There's the dis disproportionate victimization. We know that there's a high level of mental illness and health care needs that are specific to women. Drug or alcohol dependency or issues that are specific to this particular population. And sexual abuse and violence against women in prison is rampant and rarely reported for fear of many different issues that we can discuss in the Q&A. Next slide. We know they're poor and marginalized groups, they don't have economic means, and they're vulnerable to th threat and actual sexual abuse threats by um, either guards or inmates. Next slide. We're going to go through these statistics, but one of the issues that we have right now and the challenges that we're facing, not only in Puerto Rico, but in Puerto Rico and globally, is the unreliable data. Next slide. And so we know that unemployment rates are high, recidivism rates are high, and domestic violence rates amongst prisoners are high. Next slide. We know, too, in, the, in Puerto Rico, we have a very high concentration of Dominican immigrants. And we know that the police brutality policies and, and um, I'm sorry, research um, towards these particular uh, immigrant populations, whether they're Afro descendants, blacks, black Puerto Ricans or black immigrants or Dominican descendants, they have been um, documented and they have been discriminated against both in the street, threatened with deportation, and in prisons because of their national origin. And this has become a big issue that the ACLU has taken on in Puerto Rico. We know that women uh, are subject to sexual abuse by male prisoners. Next slide. So. We know that we can't count on the data, and we're trying to collect data that we can compare with the data that is available. Can we go to 16? Yeah. Um, the Feliciano, the, um, Morales Feliciano case is the class action suit. Um, basically, the entire correctional system was uh, challenged, and it held that it was found guilty of human rights violations. Um, and it was it used uh, constitutional violations, which I won't go into. We can do that in the Q&A. Could you go down to the next slide? OK. There were 25 cases stretching over a period of time from 1979 to 2004. Um, and there were constitutional principles that were violated. The Eighth Amendment was one of them. Uh, and the 14th Amendment was the other. Next slide. These are the three, these are the areas that I want to briefly talk about, and I, I know that I don't have a lot of time. I have two minutes, so I'm going to just go over these areas very quickly. We've, we looked at um, the issue of access to health care, and we found violations that refer to complaints where the prisoner recount that they have been denied health services or that the services provided are inadequate with clear disregard to their health and well-being, and we know that women have particular health needs that aren't being addressed in prisons. Um, we looked at programs and services that refer to those programs created by law or regulation that benefit those deprived from liberty, but that the authorities suspend or don't recognize capriciously. For example, time credited towards the reduction of the court-imposed sentence through educational and vocational programs that aren't being offered by the institutional services that are supposed to be offered, and in Puerto Rico, which are offered as a constitutional right. Access to justice refers to the judicial and administrative channels that are required to be made accessible to prisoners in the event that they need further access to appeal forms that address their confinement. And we noticed in our research that that was something that wasn't being provided adequately. We know that there were civil rights and liberties um, that were not being provided, and that refers to issues when prisoners confront discriminatory or retaliatory acts in the event beyond those related to the typical prison conditions, for example, freedom of expression, uh, religion, um, privacy, nas nationality, um, race, uh, LGBTQ issues, 
protection of integrity when the members of the prison population have been subject to aggression or threats by other prisoners, abuse of power, unjustified aggression or events provoked by the correctional staff to inmates or their persons, and prison conditions, situations where the prison conditions constitute cruel and unusual punishment, um, and claims of innocence. Um, and I don't have much time to talk about any others, but if you could go just to one more slide, the next one. Okay, and what, what we're doing in the report is we're taking the sustainable development goals that apply to each area, and we're applying it, and then we're using the facts of each case and showing how the sustainable development goal applies to the facts that we're finding in our findings. So, for example, in the first week, in terms of access to health care, uh, Sustainable Goal 3 applies. And in the first week of interviews, out of 23 inmates interviewed, 82.6 brought forth at least one unattended medical issue. Most are serious illnesses, and many are, trans are transmittable diseases. Um, and so I'm going to conclude that, and hopefully during question and answer, we can talk more about it. So we are. Uh, sorry, we are uh, running out of time very fast. So we're going to go straight into Dr. Ramirez's um, video that he graciously sent us about his statement. Un saludo fraternal a nuestro distinguido panel y participantes. This is William Ramirez, Executive Director of the ACLU of Puerto Rico, and panelist in combating mass incarceration improving systemic justice and policing, impact on women and marginalized communities in Latin America and the Caribbean. Greetings to the distinguished panel and participants present today at this event on how mass incarceration, systemic justice, and, in, uh, and police impacts women and marginalized communities in Latin America and the Caribbean. My apology for not being there with you to join the activity. Unfortunately, last week's events were canceled due to a snowstorm that hit the East Coast of the United States, and I was unable to return for the rescheduled event. So I am with you via, uh, via electronic technology to give you a short presentation on what we have been working on here in Puerto Rico, which we nostalgically call La Isla del Encanto. My colleague, Attorney Joanna Pinet Estrada, is there. Uh, with you today to answer any questions participants may have regarding policing violence against women in Puerto Rico. Also, I assume Dr. Jody Rode has spoken on the ongoing investigation into human rights violations in Puerto Rico prisons. In 2015, countries adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, containing 17 sustainable development goals one of these goals is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. As stated, gender equality is not only a fundamental human right, it is also the foundation for a peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable world. Providing women and girls with equal access to education, health care, decent work, and representation in political and economic decision-making processes will fuel sustainable economies and benefit societies and humanity at large. Today, I am to speak on how improving systemic justice and policing impacts and can empower women and marginalized communities in Latin America and the Caribbean, specifically in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, gender violence continues to be a major policing concern, particularly for women, uh, not only in relation to gender equality and safety concerns, but also with regard to assuring that our police department continue to reform its gender violence policies, protocols, and actual street policing practices. The Puerto Rico Police Department must reform itself, but it must do so following a proactive agenda geared to partnering, partnering with women in an effort to eradicate all forms of violence against women, and specifically but not limited to violence against women within intimate partner relationships and the family unit. Contrary to instructions that were read to women by police officers called to the scene of, the, of a domestic violence crime until as recently as last month, domestic violence is not a family affair or asunto de familia. It is a crime. 
domestic violence must be treated as a crime that that as a crime that it is and must be investigated and prosecuted accordingly answering a domestic violence call on violence call under the guidance that these acts are family affairs in the end assures impunity for the perpetrator of the crime the woman's victimizer this approach yields no arrests but rather encourages attempts to mediate the situation at hand and serves to reinforce the idea that women are responsible for settling their family affairs in the end, we all know how the situation will likely end. Police failure to respond to, to domestic violence situations as the crime that it is, has an, uh, an even greater impact on immigrant women. Undocumented immigrant women tend to be less willing to call on police for fear of being deported and or separated from their family. This is certainly true in Puerto Rico, where, a, where in a Dominican community, rather than proceeding to investigate the domestic violence claim, police often the, detain the women and other immigrants until federal immigration enforcement officers arrive at the scene. Recently, at a meeting in an offshore municipality of Puerto Rico, we were informed that it had been suggested that women who go to the police in fear of their well-being can be offered police protection in the form of a jail cell. Women would be offered a jail cell until the domestic violence situation settled. All the while, the perpetrator of the crime would remain at home, openly enjoying his impunity. This cannot be what was envisioned when the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted by participating countries, in which they included the need to promote gender equality and empowerment of women. Puerto Rico has for years faced a gender violence nightmare with a disproportionate epidemic number of violence and murders of women by their intimate partners. In order to achieve the specific gender goal adopted in the Sustainable Development Goals, from the perspective of, uh, of violence against women and policing, we believe that among other things, police in Puerto Rico must truly acknowledge and internalize that domestic violence calls are not family affairs or disputes. They are crimes and must be handled as such. As such. Police must respond to domestic violence as crimes, proceed to investigate and protect the crime scene and the evidence, even when the crime does not result in death. Police must detain or arrest the perpetrator of domestic violence, passing no judgment on the veracity of the allegations. It is the responsibility of prosecutors and courts to determine whether or how to proceed with the criminal prosecution of the case. As we all know, anything short of this can prove to be fatal. Women must be brought into, police, into the police reform arena and process as the stakeholders that they are to assure that full police reform is truly achieved and that it be inclusive of domestic violence and gender rights. Women must play an active role uh, both informing and guiding the police reform at every step of the way. Women must partner with community policing to assure that they have a voice in the policing of their own human rights and their immediate physical and gender communities. PRPD must recruit into policing more and better trained male and female officers, specifically into community policing units and units specializing in crimes of violence against women. Women should not only be proactive stakeholders in the police, in the Puerto Rico Police Department reform process, but must also become an independent overseer of policing in their communities, specifically as it relates to how police handle gender violence calls and crimes. Women community leaders must not only be informed on what the police reform means to them, but must also receive training on the newly approved policies, protocols, and procedures, and how officers must handle uh, violence against women calls for assistance. Women must also receive training on how to document violence and police response, and how to follow through to assure that both the perpetrator or the victimizer and law enforcement are held accountable for their actions or their failure to act. The Puerto Rico Police Department is the second largest police department of any U.S. jurisdiction. It is three years into the largest and most complex police reform agreement in United States Department of Justice history, a process that is slow and arduous. There has, however, been some progress. 
recently my colleague, Attorney Joanna Pineda Estrada, who is working with us on the Women's Policing Oversight Project, noticed that the new instructions uh, police are to read to victims of domestic violence stated that domestic violence is a family affair, asunto de familia. She immediately brought the matter to the attention of our newly appointed police chief, PRPD's first female superintendent of police, who acted quickly to amend the statement to clearly read, as we had recommended, that domestic violence is a crime. As minuscule as an, of an accomplishment as this short statement might seem to some, it reminds me of a question that was asked at a recent Washington, D.C. meeting of policing experts. In that meeting, we were examining the case of a 19-year-old who took his life after three years of incarceration that resulted from an ill-fated police stop. We were asked to examine the facts of that case and state our impression regarding at what stage in the process were criminal justice mistakes made that may have contributed to the tragic end in that case. I answered that I believe that criminal justice mistakes were made beginning with the initial police encounter with this young man. Like in that case that we examined, the police intervention in uh, domestic violence calls, if not handled properly, can turn out to be the first ill-fated step that will end tragically for women, women that are subjected to violence by their partners. At initial contact with a victim of, domestic, of a domestic violence crime, police officers cannot send the message that gender violence is a family affair. This is not, not only not true, it is unjust, and it causes women to shy away from seeking law enforcement assistance. Law enforcement officers take an oath to protect and to serve. On many occasions, they carry out their duties responsibly. Other times, they do not. This is the reason why we look to independent civilian oversight to watch over law enforcement and how it carries out what should be constitutional community policing. In Puerto Rico, where there are no sunshine or access to information laws and absolutely no form of independent civilian oversight of government and more specifically no form of, uh, of independent civilian, civilian oversight of police, it is incumbent on women and their allies to become empowered to lead the way for oversight of how law enforcement complies or fails to comply with its own newly established domestic violence policies and protocols. Women must become the overseers and documenters of bad and constitutional policing and must demand immediate change. Women must insist and assure that bad cops answer for their intrinsically biased policing of gender violence crimes. At the ACLU of Puerto Rico, we are relentlessly working to, to assure that women play an important role as the stakeholders that they are in assuring that the Puerto Rico Police Department reform its officers, protocols, and practices, and to assure that women become the overseers that reform of that reform as it relates to compliance of all gender violence mandates. My colleague, Attorney Joanna Pinet Estrada will answer any questions attendees may have regarding the role of women in overseeing police compliance with reform agreement mandates and protocols. Thank you for attending this important event, and please feel free to contact us at the ACLU of Puerto Rico on your next visit to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Thank you. At this moment, I will pass the microphone to Ms. Joana Pineda Estrada, who will give some brief statements uh, to add to Mr. Uh, William Remmer's statement. Good evening. My name is Joana Pineda Estrada. I'm an associate attorney for the ACLU of Puerto Rico and coordinator of the ACLU's Women's Policing Oversight Project, as Dr. Ramirez uh, mentioned earlier. I want to thank the Dominican Republic for hosting this event, and it's an honor to be here with my fellow panelists. Adding to Dr. Ramirez's presentation, in June 2012, the ACLU published Island of Impunity, Puerto Rico's Outlaw Police Form. 
This report was put together by Jennifer Turner, an attorney for the ACLU's Human, Human Rights Project, and based on the work that the ACLU of Puerto Rico had been conducting for eight years, where it documented case of police brutality and other serious rampant abuses by the police, uh, Puerto Rico Police Department. In violation of the United States Consti Constitution, the Puerto Rican Constitution, and the United States Human Rights Commitments. Sorry. <laughs> This report focused on various areas of concern within the PRPD, and the publication of this extensive investigation resulted in the recognition by the U.S. Department of Justice of the need to implement a comprehensive report, uh, reform of the Puerto Rico Police, Repo uh, Police Department, as Dr. Ramirez uh, mentioned earlier. Two of the areas mentioned in this report were uh, police brutality and the use of excessive force and other police abuse against Dominican immigrants and Puerto Ricans of Dominican descent in low-income black and Dominican communities, as well as the failure to police crimes of domestic violence and sexual assault. Dominican community leaders, the ACLU of Puerto Rico, and other civil rights advocates have for many years denounced discriminatory policing practices, including incidents of extreme police abuse motivated by national origin in, in several communities known to be predominantly inhabited by Dominican immigrants and people of Dominican re, uh, descent. According to Dominican community leaders, PRPD officers targeted communities that are known to be predominantly Dominican and officers are also targeted are targeting individuals who physically appear to be Dominican or who have who were identifiable by their accent when they spoke. The report sorry. The report also documented how victim reporting rates of domestic violence incidents were too low given Puerto Rico's population and US national rates of domestic violence. It also reported that the PRPD was not adequately responding to or investigating rape crimes, that it was significantly under-reporting these crimes and was not doing enough to ensure that women confronting domestic violence utilize the legal options available to them. What's the issue here? Um, we have unreliable data. All of the statistics published by the government agencies, such as Women's Advocate Office and other organizations, rely uh, solely on the official data that the police uh, department provides. So, as Dr. Ramirez stated, police failure to respond and investigate domestic violence situations has an even greater impact on immigrant women. Not only are, these, are the women from these communities less willing to call the police during domestic violence situations for fear of being deported, but in many cases the police themselves refuse to intervene in such domestic dispute cases. We have documented reports that the PRPD has ignored the victims, uh, the victims complaint or they attempt to dissuade the victim from filing a complaint or pressing charges against the perpetrator. In regards to gender violence and sexual assault, the police reform has forced the Puerto Rican police to establish protocols that would that will fulfill the duty of the police to educate, assist, and protect victims, which also obligates the police to take the to take the victim, victim's complaint without discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, immigration, or civil status. It also ensures the, the need for the police to follow up on victims and secure the implementation of protection orders and the duty to report and maintain statistics of these cases with their correct classifications. Under the sustainable reform uh, of, Port of the Puerto Rico Police Department, the PRPD has to appropriately classify, investigate, and report um, sexual assault and domestic violence cases. As recently as November of last year, the PRPD published its revised protocol for interventions in domestic violence incident. This uh, protocol includes a step-by-step -step, step instructions for all PRPD members that intervene in domestic violence situations. It, at the ACLU's um, Women Policing Oversight Project, our main objective has been to implement and monitor 
the execution of the PRPD's uh, reform as it pertains to gender violence and sexual assault cases, as well as to monitor the compliance of protocols and regulations developed by the police as mandated by the reform. There are three main components of, of the project. Education, promoting civilian oversight, and monitoring the reform by the ACLU. As, to, as for education, we have developed workshops and trainings to educate communities on gender violence and sexual assault, as well as to explain protocols developed by the police to the process of filing complaints and protection order, uh, orders of protection. Um, we wish to promote um, civilian oversight so we work to create a collective effort to guarantee that the PRPD adequately complies with the protocols they develop to tend to domestic and gender violence and sexual assaults. And last but not least, we receive complaints from citizens that feel that the Puerto Rico Police Department has not adequately handled their reporting um, or uh, complaints about other civil rights violations that the police uh, department has done. So I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, our last speaker of the night, but definitely just as important, is Mich Mich Michelle Leong uh, from Vice Media. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I know it's late, so I will try to be brief. Um, my name is Michelle Young, and I am a producer and reporter with Vice Media here in New York. And I just want to talk a little bit about kind of my experience in reporting on the plethora of issues that we've kind of addressed here today that face women and marginalized communities and kind of how I understand my industry's role uh, in addressing those. Um, so yeah, last year uh, I was put on assignment to cover several stories in Rio uh, in the lead up to the 2016 Olympics. Uh, if you remember, this was a very uh, this was a time of very heightened unrest in the country. Uh, Dilma Rousseff, who was the first female president of Brazil, was in the midst of being ousted by her conservative vice president Michel Temer. Um, and in addition to that, there was a lot of controversy around how the country was handling um, preparations for the Olympics. Um, because of this, there was pretty much daily protests. Um, this was a really unique moment in history where a massive scrutinizing spotlight of international media attention was focused on the country. Uh, and it was bringing to light a lot of issues um, that had been historic historically chronic to Brazilian society. So when the violent gang rape of a 16-year-old girl in Rio was shared widely across social media just two months before the games, thousands of women uh, and allies took to the streets in protest, and the media took note. Rape and violence against women is not uncommon in Brazil. Most data reports that a woman there is raped every 11 minutes, and we know that most rapes go unreported. Um, so I don't think it was just the sheer barbarity of this young girl's assault and how it was disseminated across social media that sparked this historic uprising uh, of women and activists, but the fact that they also knew that someone was finally listening. When I spoke with activists on the ground, they had a very coherent understanding that the media played a critical role in exposing violence against women, in shaping national conversation, and in shifting national policies, um, and that this was a rare moment that they already had the whole world watching. Um, I was gonna show you a brief clip, but it's not that brief, and I know we're out of time, so. Um, Anyways, there was a lot of international attention on this, myself included, was reporting on this issue uh, with Pro Professor Rory here. Um, you wanna show it? It's long. Okay, all right, all right, do you wanna watch? Okay, uh, I, oh, do I have to, I don't have it set up. It's okay, we'll set it up while you do it. Are you sure, we can, we'll watch it after. Okay. We're gonna watch it after. It'll, it'll be a nice end cap, all right. Um, so. 
if anyone remembers, this was widely reported in international media. Most of you will probably probably remember this uh, uh, this story making national headlines. Um, and as soon as international attention on this one case started to really ramp up, um, the lead investigator uh, for the the victim, who originally questioned if it was even a case of rape, was immediately removed. Um, the crime was investigated, several men were arrested and charged for the crime. This is a rare glimpse of justice for a country like Brazil. Um, and I know that it would have been a very different story for this young victim if it didn't receive the press coverage that it did. So for me, working on this piece really forced me to consider the purpose of my own profession as it relates to gender-based violence. I wondered um, how this story would be reported if, if it were, I wondered how this story would be reported if it weren't so closely tied to this mega event, to the Olympics to begin with. Uh, I wondered if it would be covered at all, if it were a reported 15 men instead of 30, or if the victim were 25 instead of 16. Um, and I wondered how bad violence against women has to be to provoke a response in the news, um, in the media, or otherwise. So in the limited reporting that is done on violence against women, much of it is, as we know, fraught with sexist interpretations, with victim blaming, um, and it's so often told through a lens of deeply embedded misogyny. Um, and for me, reporting like this makes media and journalism complicit in perpetuating this violence against women that we are talking about today um, by excusing it, by normalizing it, and by sensationalizing it. And the problem I see isn't just in how many of these stories are told, but when. So part of the issue in covering these topics is that violent violence against women in places like Latin America is regarded as a fact and not as a story. The problem is so prevalent throughout society and it so permeates daily life that women's experiences with violence are turned into listicles and they're turned into data. Um, and only those particularly gruesome cases that fall outside the realms of that everyday violence are reported on. Um, as journalists, though, our job is not to set the standards for what violence is graphic enough or out of the ordinary enough for us to cover, but to continually search for story after story after story that can communicate and document and bring to light every nuance and shade of this epidemic that we're suffering that is the widespread global violence against women. And as women, we are already equipped with an intimate understanding of this epidemic. Whether we've experienced violence ourselves or not, the threat and the likelihood of it is something that's deeply ingrained into the experience of just being a woman. And, <clears throat> excuse me, as female journalists, we know that the story of violence against women is more than just statistics um, or sensationalized grues gruesomeness and we know that it's a story, story that's far from being told. So we need more female journalists in the field uh, telling these stories from their own communities because we are the ones who understand what's at stake. Um, <clears throat> sorry, there's no more, there's no more significant a tool than the press in shifting social and cultural norms. And if we're going to be talking about changing the cultural norm of violence against women, then we, women need to be the ones wielding this tool. And across the globe, women are, not, are, women are only making up roughly one third of the journalism workforce. Um, it's an industry that has one of the highest gender pay gaps with extremely high rates of reported sexual harassment and abuse, both in the workplace and in the fields. Uh, with continuing sexist hiring and promotion practice practices. And issues like these have by and large kept the gender disparity between men and women in newsrooms nearly the same as it was in the 1980s. So yes, we face some challenges. 
Uh, I sometimes feel discouraged when I remember that that's the landscape I exist in, both as a woman and as a professional. But I've also seen a lot that makes me hopeful. Uh, in the past three years that I've been working at Vice, I've seen the company make a concerted effort in addressing these issues and hiring more women to managerial positions. Uh, and it's these women that have pushed to cover those difficult topics, to cover like violence against women. Um, it is the reason that I'm here today, and it's the reason that I was able to cover the piece that I did with Jody that you might be able to watch after. Um, and in the past two years, we have launched Broadly, which is a women-focused channel that's quickly rose to one of our most successful outlets in the company. And just last year, we partnered with Gloria Steinem, an activist and co-founder of the Women's Media Center, to launch a documentary series on our TV network entirely dedicated to stories of global womanhood and gender-based violence. Uh, and this all makes me hopeful, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because we are actively showing that it's a successful, it's a successful business model run by and for women. It shows that people are interested in these types of stories, um, and it sets an example for other outlets to follow. Um, so at risk of sounding cheesy, I do truly believe that newsrooms must be an equitable place in order to accomplish the kind of journalism the world needs and that people deserve. Um, and I think we need to demand and push for policies and programs that promote gender equality in the workforce and in our newsrooms, as we understand that is a crucial step in this greater movement towards true gender equality and the eradication of gender-based violence. Thank you. I know we have gone a little bit over time, and thank you for your patience, but I also know that there's some students in the audience that would like to ask our panelists some questions. So I'm gonna now officially open it up. Um, and yes. Where's our first student? Oh yeah. <laughs> my name is Santos Garcia, and I am a freshman at John Jay College. Uh, my question is, uh, in what ways do political institutions throughout Latin America impede the progress of Sustainable Development Goal 5, which is achieving gender equality? Uh, and what will be a solution? First of all, uh, the first plan, 15-year plan, was the Millennium Development Goals. It was from 2000 to 2015. And the main reason was to bring extreme forms of poverty to bring it down with 50%. And I can tell you that that goal was reached. So in 2014, poverty was brought back down with at least 50%. And, but the reason why was China has done very great. So China was able to bring a lot of people in extreme poverty in, um, in, in a better situation. And Brazil also with the Bolsa Familia plan, Brazil did a wonderful job. Um, after, the, after 2015, we started with a new plan. And the new plan is the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal. And the main goal of the Sustainable Development Goals is to eliminate all forms of extreme poverty. So that's a very ambitious goal. You know, it's very, it's very ambitious. And, we at the United Nations, I know all the diplomats, we are really excited in order to reach that goal. The link with um, MDG, MDG 5 and SDG 5, they both are 5, is that we're talking about 50%. My presentation started with half of the world community. We have seen how extensive, how, how, how huge the problems are that women are confronted with. So. Um, and this is my, my personal view, if we concentrate really strong on SGB, SGD 5, um, and at the end of you know, the 15 years, we can say that, hey, FG, F, SGD 5 has been um, reached, then obviously you know, we will be in a better world. So um, that's the link between SDG number five and the sustainable development goals. I can also say that uh, during the negotiations of the SDGs, I spoke on behalf of 40, 42 or 43 member states 
And our request was uh, twofold. First, to have a separate goal. We got the separate goal. And also to have gender, you know, to have it linked to with every uh, other goals as well. So if you read the document, you will see that um, there are 17 goals and 169 targets, or 79, 60, 69 or 67 targets. And these targets are also linked to the MGG-5. So um, almost 100% of what we ask is in that document. There was one thing is missing in that document. And maybe I was a little bit too late with that. You will see that there's no meal paragraph. There is nothing on working on meals. Or maybe the United Nations was not that far at that time yet. But um, that is the only thing missing. Because of, besides that, I think we have been able to get everything that the member states and civil society asks for has been included in the SDG. Thank you very much. I hope I have been uh, <laughs> complete enough. When it comes to um, uh, gender equality, so for example, in, in Puerto Rico, we are having a 40, as, as uh, Professor Fernando stated in her, in her talk, it's been 40 years that we haven't been able to achieve uh, the inclusion of uh, gender in the curriculum. We, we, we just simply cannot get the inclusion of gender in the public school curriculum. Um, and if we can't teach our children about gender equality, um, how are we supposed to meet SDG 5? Um, so basic, simple concepts, uh, starting with education. Again, I'm an academic, right? So I'm, of course, I'm going to turn to education. But if we, have a, if we want to turn to something a little bit more extreme, if we have countries in our region that allow for concubines um, and you know, we're promoting marriage, <laughs> uh, the concept of, uh, same se of, of heterosexual marriage only, and we allow for concubinage, I mean, that's a tough situation to promote gender equality, um, and, and, and it, that's not going to work, right? So we have to take a look at our laws, our, our, our laws regarding uh, gender and our laws regarding marriage and, and, and really start working to lobby to make those equitable um, from a gender perspective. So why don't we turn to the, to the piece so before we go to the Q&A. We're right in the center of Rio de Janeiro. The streets are closed off because there is a big protest of feminists fighting against rape culture here in Brazil. For almost a year, a movement that's been called Feminist Spring has been gaining momentum across Brazil. And in the wake of current events, the movement has found new urgency. Vocês devem estar acompanhando, a gente sofreu um golpe chamado impeachment e a primeira presidenta mulher foi retirada do governo e o governo interino é formado por somente por homens. Dilma Rousseff, Brazil's first female president, was suspended from office in May 2016 under charges of mismanaging Brazil's economy. She was replaced by the conservative politician Michel Temer tem misturado nisso tudo um grau de grande preconceito contra a mulher. Tem atitudes comigo que não teriam com um presidente homem. Só, só criticando a mulher, fazendo esse impeachment para tirar a mulher. A mulher não fez nada, por que, que vai tirar ela? Rousseff was, for young girls, amazing in Brazil, in the sense that a woman could become president with the suspension of Rousseff and the new interim president and his conservative cabinet, advances that women have struggled and some have died for over the past 50 years are at risk. Just as Rousseff's suspension began, another event occurred that sent shockwaves throughout the country. Isso calhou de acontecer justo quando uma menina, uma menor de idade de 16 anos, foi estuprada por 33 homens. E eu acordei num lugar totalmente diferente, com um homem embaixo de mim, um em cima e dois segurando a minha mão. Várias pessoas rindo de mim. The case received international attention when a graphic video of the underage victim was widely shared across social media. 
But one of the most disturbing things about that particular case was that the video was uploaded onto the internet and it was light. The remarks made by these aggressors, no matter how atrocious they are, were accepted by so many common people. It is something that just illustrates that violence against women is normal. Houve nos últimos tempos aqui no Brasil é, uma, um culto à violência contra a mulher, sem que nenhum dos agressores fossem punidos. Né? Brazil has a complaint of violence against women every seven minutes. We know that 50,000 rapes were committed in Brazil in 2011. That's about 138 rapes per day. The point is, there's too many rapes occurring too frequently, and something has to be done about that. One of the feminist groups that participated in the rally is Feminicidade, who have bases in São Paulo and Rio. The group has made a name for themselves by coming up with innovative ways to protest, including a project in public spaces with anti-rape messages. Percebo que a gente está nesses últimos anos tendo uma oportunidade de repensar coisas que a gente vivia que era tão naturais na nossa vida. Eu acho que sim. Me parece que o um, um grande forte do, do projeto é essa coisa do contar a história, sabe? Acho que é uma coisa que é diferente de todos os outros movimentos que eu vi aqui. In the spirit of feminicidade, other groups are doing everything from staging mass art exhibits to initiating social media campaigns to creating interactive machines and train stations that allow women to report sexual and domestic assaults. At the same time, public protests are continuing. International attention can help create tangible policy change on the ground. The majority of that responsibility falls on the ability of the women's movement in Brazil to bring shame against the government of Brazil to make them act. Senão não faz sentido eu estar tá lutando por nada. Segura, segura, segura seu machista. América Latina vai ser toda feminista. Ok, we have time for one or two more questions. Um, Bradley. My name is Bradley Stein. I'm a freshman at John Jay College. My question is for Ambassador McDonald. Uh, first of all, Mr. Ambassador, I think I speak for everyone here tonight in thanking you once again for your presence here at this forum and your work in this crucial field. You've spoken at length tonight about your He for She advocacy campaign. My question is, can you give us an example of a policy or reform that your country initiated that showed results in accomplishing the goals of your He for She campaign that you advocated for? Let me see. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much for your question. I will, I will try to be brief. Um, two years ago, Suriname and Iceland, uh, we organized here at the United Nations a barbershop conference. And um, it was a barbershop conference. First of all, Iceland and I and, and Suriname, we wanted to organize an all-male conference to discuss violence against women. But the first female colleague I talked to, she was a diplomat from Liberia, she said, Ambassador, this is discrimination. How can that be? Only males. So I thought then deeper a little bit about it, and then I came with this idea of a barbershop. A barbershop is not an all-male space. It's a male-dominated space, but it's not only all-male. And what do, what do we discuss in barbershops, the men? We discuss sports. We discuss politics and women. But the women discussion is not a healthy discussion. They need to have a certain shape. They need to cook. They need to take care of children. Those things are the things we like to talk about. So we wanted to have a real positive, good conversation with the male diplomats at the UN. And I can tell you that at the barbershop, we had a lunch where I think at least 130 male ambassadors were there. It was the first meeting at the United Nations or everywhere 
where you have more men in the room because there are more male ambassadors. I think there are only 35 or 36 female ambassadors. The rest are male. Where we, we have so many males discussing these issues. And I can tell you some of the <laughs> things which I've heard that are really embarrassing. And that's why I think it is good for um, to have programs and projects to, to approach men. Because as I say, there are a lot of bad guys, but the good guys, they don't know the facts as well. So that is one of the m practical things which uh, we, have we have done, Suriname and Iceland. And I can tell you that on the 15th of June, since there is, uh, there's a lot of requests to do it again, on the 15th of June, we will have a second barbershop conference at the United Nations. A, a beautiful thing was also, uh, it was a two-day conference, and um, the first day we also had a, a reception, was the first reception of a uh, United Nations event that was organized in the Blind Barber. There's a bar here in New York, the Blind Barber, and we did it there. It was a great success. So thank you very much for your question. At this time, I know that one of the RHB pre-law fellows, uh, Magdalena Oropesa, has some questions for the panel. Uh, so my question is for uh, Michelle Leung. And so my question is, what do you think could be the most important role the media could play in reaching uh, SDG 16? So more specifically, ensuring that national and international institutions become more effective, inclusive, and transparent. If you think about it, the media's goal and our work is to do is to do that in the first place. Um, it's almost like the Hippocratic oath that we take when we enter this profession um, is holding uh, governmental institutions and individuals and businesses, whoever it might be, in the public accountable uh, to do what they say they're going to do. Um, it's particularly interesting that you talk about transparency. Um, because right now, bringing it back down to a national level, we are having a lot of difficult conversations about what the media's role is and how we're going to cover uh, a presidential administration uh, who is bent on being opaque about their policies, um, who tell alternative facts, um, et cetera. And I think that right now, we in the media, journalists, um, are having a bit of a crisis, um, and but also in a good way that we have kind of been reinvigorated um, in what it is that we set out to do um, in making sure that we're covering issues and that we are making sure that governments are transparent in what they're doing and that we are communicating those issues um, or the actions of any governmental body to the people. Um, in a way that lets them make informed decisions. Um, so to answer your question in a million different ways, because I wasn't prepared, um, I think that they can play a huge role in it, but I think that um, I think that they need to be supported, and I think that if we want the media to be, if we want me the media and journalists to be um, doing the job that they set out to do, then we need to also be supporting policies that protect journalists, um, especially in countries that uh, have high rates of murder of journalists who are exposing the truths, and we need to be um, supporting freedom of the press um, here in the US and abroad. So that's what I would say to that. Thanks. Our other members of the audience have any questions? Hello, everyone. My name is Ayodele Adeyanju. I'm a currently a junior at John Jay College. My question's for um, Ambassador McDonald. You might have answered this already, but um, as a he for she campaign and ambassador for the advancement of women, what steps can we take to convince men that women's empowerment is not an inclusive issue and that we should act in solidarity? towards change. Oh, what steps can we take to convince men that um, women's empowerment is not an is not an inclusive issue and that we should um, act in solidarity towards um, change? 
I'd like to thank you very much for your question also. I'd like to answer these questions by, by, by giving you examples. Two years ago, I, one, one, one year ago, I think, last year, I spoke at uh, New York University at a one year anniversary of the Shibuk girls, the kidnapping of the 300 girls in, uh, in, um, in uh, Nigeria, the Boko Haram story. And there was a question from a male. The, the, the room was full with a lot of students from the African region, master students. And um, there was a question at the end of um, this session. And the question was, Ambassador, even though, even though I agree with all what you have said and uh, that we need to work on women's empowerment, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but since these girls have been kidnapped a year ago, for a year, is it wise to spend so much energy, time, resources in order to find these girls? And it was interesting that while this guy was uh, you know, formulating his question, all the women in the room were like, how dare you asking a question like that? But the guys in the room were like, hmm, he has a point. <laughs> so at that moment, I saw, you know, the, the difference between male and female thinking. And the guys were more about respect for their traditions and religion, and they were making those points. I believe that what we should do is to create, a. it needs to become a crusade. We need to create a platform also for men to talk with other men because this is an issue women don't talk about it to us. They don't share these experiences, sometimes not even with their friends or with their family members. They, they know just about how it is and then they find a way to deal with it. But we need to do things like the barbershop, conferences like this, sessions like this, um, approach um, sport teams and uh, everywhere where guys are there to approach them in order for them to know that the security of the people, that's my point, the, the security of the people they, mo they love the most is at stake and they can do something about it. Because as I said in my presentation, when you're with your daughter, then she's safe. The moment she, you are not with her, she's not safe anymore because she's just one of the other women. So what we should do is to see, to find ways because it is not going smoothly, the he for she campaign. I, I would like to, for this to go faster. You know, one country, and that is the country that is as number one on the global gender gap report is Iceland. Iceland is really, you know, I'm, um, Rwanda is also an, an, a very interesting case in, in Africa to see that, uh, you know, it can work and uh, that a lot of men, they already, when I speak, I tell people, they don't always need to listen to me. Just talk to every man from Iceland or from Rwanda because they are living that life already where women are being empowered, where women are, you know, in all um, spheres of life. And, um, but with regard to violence, I earnestly believe that men need to talk more with each other in order to convince uh, their peers that fighting for violence against, fi fighting to stop violence against women, gender equality, is in their own personal benefit. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Chair. My name is Agnes Day with the New Future Foundation. I have a question concerning the prisons. Um, why are there so much murders and crime in prison? Do you need more cameras, more staff, or why is this still going on? Uh, Mr. Ambassador. ask the, the real professor to, to, to I answer. I always want to know. 
everybody that go to jail is not a bad person. Yeah. But you figure you're on the security, you're safe. And still people getting hurt and killed. Why is that? I, uh, professor, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I have a colleague in the room who's a specialist in criminal justice. His name is Jose Luis Morin. So I'm going to ask you afterwards to touch base with him. Jose, could you raise your hand? Um, he just recently wrote a book on this topic, and I think he'd be a great person for you to talk to about it. Um, I could tell you, based on our preliminary studies, um, right now we're uh, – finalizing our state interviews um, from that perspective. And we, we don't have a Freedom of Information Act in Puerto Rico and the sun, No Sunshine Laws, which you heard um, our, the executive director um, state in his um, video uh, presentation. Um, so we have to wait for those documents to come in. But we know that there are not cameras in every corner. Um, we know that they don't have the sufficient up-to-date technology available to be able to cover um, we also know that um, right now Puerto Rico is in a financial crisis, and we know that even prior to the financial crisis, they don't have the sufficient staff that would be required um, to properly, adequately um, handle what would be optimal, right, to secure all of the inmates in the prisons. Um, we know that we have that same situation with uh, Rikers Island. I'm sure you are very familiar with that in New York City and New York Times and um, you know, I was just talking to the ambassador about the situations in Rikers Island. We had a student, uh, Khalif Brower, I'm sure you heard about him um, in the New York Times, and that was a CUNY student that went through our reentry program um, who unfortunately took his life after spending three years um, in Rikers Island because he couldn't make bail, um, and there was no evidence against him, uh, and he was never found guilty. He was just... Uh, uh, waiting for trial, um, and there was, I mean, he, there was no reason for him to have been in Rikers, uh, except that he was a 16-year-old African-American male in the Bronx, um, and, um, you know, he was uh, uh, seriously uh, abused by both inmates and uh, prison personnel. Um, so that, there's a, there's a lot of lack of um, adequate personnel, um, a lack of training, um, and, you know, there are gangs in prisons. Um, we, we don't talk much about that. Um, and uh, there's a whole other world inside of the prisons, and I don't hold myself out to be an expert. I'm just talking to you briefly about the observations that we're making right now, which is why I'm going to defer to my, my colleague there. I have a question, too. C can I, I since uh, the, the other professor will speak, I have one question as well. I read a report, a study, uh, where is seven in te the, the top ten countries of femicide, seven of these countries are from Latin America and the Caribbean. Brazil was on that list. I think the only country that uh, was not from our region or one of the countries was Russia. But the interesting thing was that Suriname, my country, was on that list as the only Caribbean country. So the other six were Latin American countries, countries in Central America, Brazil, I think Colombia was on that list, and Suriname. But the reason for uh, femicides to be so high in these countries were threefold. Trafficking in persons, drug trafficking, and gang-based violence. Well, these three things are not a factor in Suriname. So in my discussions with the the, the leadership, the minister responsible for women affairs, the only thing that comes to mind is domestic violence. Almost Suriname is a country of 500,000 people, half a million. In a year, we have roughly, let's say, 40, 38 to 40 murder cases, while more than half are domestic violence cases. So can you just uh, explain to me why what the problem is in our region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, for femicides to be so high that seven of the top ten countries are from our region? Um, well, uh, I think that's a very important question. And I think the connection between your question and her question is that violence has become so normalized, right? Especially violence against women, but also violence in, in various sectors of our society. 
so if you take the, the, the situation in prisons, for example, um, the violence has become part of what prison life is about, and everyone accepts that that kind of violence is, um, is what being in, in prison is about. And, and coupled with that is the impunity that goes with it, right? So um, corrections officers who were responsible for ensuring the safety of persons being imprisoned, right, have been lax and have been allowed, in essence, in many ways, um, the, the freedom to be able to violate the civil rights of the individuals that are being imprisoned. Um, and in the same way, when we talk about violence against women, we're also seeing violence um, happening uh, in so many different ways, in terms of criminality, as you have noted, right? Um, but that level of criminality also means that it also has become a, uh, a norm that uh, allows w women to be subject to that kind of violence, right? So it's not just violence, the crime that, um, the crime that is associated, that comes with, with violence, but crime that, um, that is committed against women has also been normalized whether it's in the form of domestic violence or whether it's in the form of, of women prisoners, of which women are, um, are often victimized within, within prison systems. And, and I think the other issue is that we also need to be very careful that yes, there may be high levels of domestic violence um, and abuse of women in various Latin American countries, but we oftentimes fail to realize how underreported it is here in this country and in other countries around the world. So just because the focus tends to be in certain countries doesn't mean that it's not happening as a worldwide phenomenon. And we need to be sure that we're not falling into that trap of thinking, oh yeah, that problem is only those countries. And it's not, it's not something that we need to pay attention to here. Uh, because when you go deeper into the statistics, when you go deeper into the reality, then you start seeing that it is a global problem. Yeah. Right. So, so that that was going to be part of my point. So one of the things that we're doing right now is the unreliability of data. So some of the country studies, when you look at who's reporting in the study, you'll see that there are lack of country participants. So a lot of nation states either don't participate or their statistics are underreporting. And that underreporting could be as simple as improper police reports. So for example, um, there could be a domestic violence incident that may not have been reported because they um, contextualize or they report that crime as a car accident. But they're not further investigating it for whatever other reason, and that there could, the intention of that particular driver could have been to kill his wife, mm -hmm. right? So some of these crimes are underreported. So I'll give you one example. I was called as an expert witness on, on, on two asylum cases from Brazil. Um, and uh, at that particular time, CNN had come out with a report. Ten women um, uh, in Brazil are, 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 ra are, are killed a day, right? It's CNN headlines. Of course, everybody believes CNN headlines. I knew, based on my research on Brazil, I wrote my doctoral dissertation, and I had worked on the preliminary steps of changing the Maria de Pena law when it was law 9099, that it was impossible to gather that data because they didn't even have computerized statistics. <laughs> they were using paper data for decades. So there was no way for a country to be able to, to have a systemic, centralized data reporting system of all the homicide rates and then be able to aggregate or disaggregate that data because they, there was no centralized processing of that data at least not accurately. There was maybe per region, and some of it was, it was all hand-filled, right? So there was no computerized way, and even if they were computerizing it, they were only computerizing from a certain point of time to the other, and if it was in a district where there was no electricity, as we know in our countries, right, <laughs> then they weren't compilating all of the data that was existing anyway. So there was no way to accurately report that statistic. Even in countries that are developed where you can accurately report that, there's still limitations on the data. So sometimes we feel like, wow, our region is so much worse. But it's, if other regions are under-reporting, of course our regions are so much worse. I'm not saying that the problem no, no, sure. isn't there, because the problem is there. Whether it's that dire is the question. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the point that Jose is making. Well, my name is Sara. 
I'm Brazilian, so that's why I needed to say something. I, I'm really glad that you brought this video about what happened there. And I would like to just highlight uh, some things about Brazil, just as a compliment of what you guys said. I'm sorry about my English, so you know, I'm practicing. So I'm here representing a group of 14 organizations. They are, they are like white and black organizations. And we are together again as an answer of the government that what happened, just as you said, like our president was impeached. So now this new government is really conservative. So we are losing most of our rights that were achieved. And most of the people that are losing are the black people. So I'm here talking as a black woman as well. And I would like to about uh, domestic violence. And there was there is this study from 2015, and 50% of the women that dies in Brazil, they die from domestic violence, and and 33% of the those women are black. So we are in the bottom of the param, our social param. So we die of sexual violence, domestic violence. Uh, most of the incarcerated women today in Brazil are black. Most of the incarcerated girls in Brazil are black. It's the same thing with men. So I, I'm here in this event actually to highlight our w black women situation in Brazil. And for us, it's really important to discuss with Latin Americans and Caribbean countries because we want to think together how we build actions to solve our problem. In Brazil, we can't talk about gender without talking about race. So that, that's it, so just highlight this. Thank you. Okay, so now we will conclude our session by thanking all of our distinguished panelists and their expertise and insights on this extremely important topic on violence against women. I hope there will be similar opportunities moving forward. And we must remember that gender equality and the elimination of all forms of violence against women and girls are instrumental to the achievement of all 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you to our member states, students, NGOs, special guests here tonight. And special thanks to Luz Andujar, Roxana Reyes, Yamile Eusebio, Mark Jordan, Serena Masak, Jackie Nieves, Melanie Monroy, Cherise Mora, Magdalena Ropesa, Joanna Pinet, and Jose Luis Morin for all their efforts and time behind the scenes. Buenas noches.